Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. Um, welcome again to the SBTI webinar on Beyond Value Chain Mitigation. We are delighted to have you today, where we are going to talk about the new reports recently released by SBTI. Um, my name is Alberto Carrillo. I'm Chief Data Officer for the SBTI, and I'm very happy to welcome you into this webinar. The goal of this webinar is to provide you with an overview of the two reports that we recently launched on how to accelerate corporate, corporate climate action beyond value chain and to encourage corporates to adopt high impact and high integrity actions on beyond value chain integration. We want to have a very open and uh, constructive conversation. Um, and we're hosting this webinar to show not only what SBTI is doing, but also to show how other players in the ecosystem are working to accelerate corporate adoption of beyond value chain mitigation. Um, we believe that no one actor and no one action will be sufficient to scale up beyond value chain mitigation and to create a norm around this topic. Every actor has a role in building a network of influence over time that encourages greater climate action in the corporate sector. For this reason, we are delighted to be joined by representatives from other organizations in the corporate climate ecosystem, including the Gold Standard, the Voluntary Carbon Markets Integrity, and the LEAP Coalition. The views that each organization are sharing in this, in this session are strictly the views of those organizations and we welcome their views today in the spirit of having an open discussion and debate. Um, we recognize that um, with such lineup, time is gonna be tight and we will make time at the end to answer some questions um, from you. Um, please submit your questions via the JOT form link that we have shared in the chat. And now I will hand over to my colleague, Alice, that is gonna introduce today's speakers and provide background and um, information on the session today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Alberto. My name is Alice Farley, and I'm a Net Zero Senior Analyst at the SBTI. In addition to myself, Alberto and Scarlett, we're delighted to have three guests with us today. Owen Hewlett, the Chief Technical Officer at Gold Standard, Mark Kenber, the Executive Director at the Voluntary Carbon Markets Integrity Initiative, or VCMI, and Aaron Bloomgarden, the CEO of Emergent, which convenes the LEAF Coalition. Please note that the recording of this webinar and the slides will be available on the SBTI website soon. The SBTI is a corporate climate action organization that enables companies and financial institutions worldwide to play their part in combating the climate crisis. There are nearly 5,000 companies now worldwide with a validated science-based target. We first released the corporate net zero standard in 2021, and more than 700 companies now have validated net zero targets. The corporate net zero standard has four core elements near-term targets, long-term targets, neutralization, and beyond value chain mitigation. Near-term science-based targets have a five to 10 year timeframe for companies to reduce scope one and two emissions in line with the 1.5 degree pathway and scope three emissions in line with the well below two degree pathway. Long-term science-based targets are to reduce value chain emissions to a residual level in line with the 1.5 degree pathway no later than 2050. Our cross-sector pathway requires companies to reduce their emissions by 90% or more by 2050. Once they have cut all possible emissions through their near-term and long-term targets, the standard requires companies to neutralize residual emissions that continue to be released into the atmosphere. These residual emissions must be counterbalanced by permanent removal and storage of carbon into the atmosphere. The fourth core element of the corporate net zero standard is the reason we're all here today, beyond value chain mitigation, or BVCM. Companies are recommended but not required to deliver BVCM. The corporate net zero standard says, companies should take action or make investments outside their own value chains to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions in addition to their near-term and long-term science-based targets. For example, a company could provide annual support to projects, programs, and solutions that provide quantifiable benefits to climate, especially those that generate additional co-benefits for people and nature. Companies should report annually on the nature and scale of those actions pending further guidance. It is essential to underscore that BVCM must not replace or delay a company's efforts to reduce their value chain emissions in line with the 1.5 degree pathway. 
This is consistent with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's sixth assessment report, which states that unless there are immediate and deep emissions reductions across all sectors, limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius will be beyond reach. And it states that options are now available in every sector that can at least halve emissions by 20, 2030. Given the increasing urgency and scale of the climate crisis, the SBTI encourages all companies to go beyond their net zero targets and take immediate and consistent action to deliver BVCM. The potential for BVCM to deliver additional mitigation and climate finance is significant. To illustrate, if in 2022 all companies with validated science-based targets had delivered BVCM equivalent to 100% of their scope 1 and 2 emissions, this would have resulted in 422 million tonnes of CO2e of BVCM in that year. This is more than 2.5 times the volume of carbon credits retired in the voluntary carbon market globally in 2022, and greater than the UK's greenhouse gas emissions for that year. Given the need for companies to go above and beyond their science-based targets to also deliver BVCM, the SBTI last month published two new reports on BVCM that together seek to increase corporate adoption of BVCM. The Above and Beyond BVCM report was developed to support companies in the design and implementation of BVCM strategies to accelerate progress towards global net zero. The Raising the Bar BVCM report draws upon SBTI research on barriers and incentives for BVCM and proposes recommendations for a range of actors to accelerate corporate adoption and implementation of BVCM. I will now pass to Scarlett, who will provide an overview of both reports. Thank you so much, Alice and Alberto. Um, so I will start with the Above and Beyond report, uh, which provides recommendations for companies on the design and implementation of BVCM. The Above and Beyond report re-emphasizes the definition of BVCM that was laid out in the corporate net zero standard. BVCM is defined as mitigation action or investment that fall outside a company's value chain, including activities that avoid or reduce greenhouse gas emissions or, avoid and, uh, or remove and store greenhouse gas emissions from the atmosphere. The purpose of BVCM, uh, next slide, yeah, is, um, is twofold. So firstly, BVCM enables companies to accelerate the global net zero transition by helping other economic and social actors to reduce and or remove greenhouse gas emissions. Secondly, BVCM allows companies to take responsibility for unabated emissions that continue to be released into the atmosphere as they progress towards the delivery of their science-based targets. The timing of BVCM uh, is immediate. We call for companies to take immediate and consistent action to deliver BVCM as they transition to net zero. I'll briefly talk through the business case now. Uh, so in the development of this report, we ran a corporate survey and we interviewed a number of companies to understand the business case for BVCM. We believe that funding of BVCM, if done right, can unlock an array of opportunities, mitigate future risks and protect and enhance long-term value. We argue that the business case for BVCM will depend on the region, market and industry in which the company is impacted, uh, in which the company sits, um, and it's impacted by the changing physical environment linked to climate change and associated changes in policy, financial markets, consumer markets, society and technology. Our research identified that BVCM can help companies to secure access to finance. For instance, as a purely illustrative example, a fashion company might fund the protection of the Amazon rainforest to signal that it is a purpose-led brand and to attract investors focused on purposeful businesses. BBCM can also help companies to differentiate their brands in the eyes of consumers. For example, again, illustrative, a telecommunications company might fund the development of solar mini grids to differentiate itself from its peers and to unlock opportunities for price premiums linked to climate leadership. BVCM presents opportunities linked to the transition of low carbon technologies. For example, an aviation company might fund BVCM by purchasing direct air capture and carbon storage carbon credits to help scale the, avail scale the availability of this technology and to bring back down costs. BVCM is a way in which companies can demonstrate the social license to operate, uh, which I think is the next slide. 
Uh, for example, a highly profitable technology company might uh, fund a portfolio of BVCM activities to demonstrate to civil society and regulators that its privileged economic position is balanced by tangible social responsibility. BVCM activities and investments as a supplement to scope one, two and three abatement could potentially reduce future policy or litigation risk where BVCM is aligned with the polluter payers principle set out in the 1992 Rio Declaration, which signifies that those that produce pollution should bear the costs of managing it to prevent damage to human health or the environment. Companies can also realize opportunities linked to governmental efforts to incentivize corporate action on climate through, for example, subsidies and tax incentives. Again, as an illustrative example, a media company might invest into a blended finance mechanism that finances nature-based solutions in sub-Saharan Africa, whereby development finance is leveraged to attract and de-risk private sector investment into developing and emerging economies. Last but not least, BVCM can help companies to mitigate physical climate risks, such as rising temperature, sea level rise, extreme weather events, resource scarcity, ecosystem degradation, et cetera, and realize opportunities linked, linked to resilience and climate adaptation. As an example, a manufacturing company might fund the protection, sorry, the restoration uh, of coastal ecosystems adjacent to its production, production facilities to mitigate the risk of cost increases or loss of revenue linked to storm surges damaging production facilities. So the report uh, defines two goals and four principles that can be used by companies to inform their BVCM strategy design and implementation. The first goal places emphasis on realizing additional mitigation outcomes this decade measured in tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. The second goal is focused on driving new financial flows towards the scale up of climate solutions and enabling activities needed to unlock the systemic transformation in the longer term towards mid-century and thereafter. This is aligned with the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, definition of climate mitigation finance, in which the expected effect aims to reduce net greenhouse gas emissions. The principles are scale, financing need, co-benefits and climate justice. On the next slide, I will dig into these principles further. Uh, it's to be clear, the document does not specify how these different goals or principles should be weighted by companies, as we believe that all elements are fundamental in addressing the climate crisis. Annex B of this report describes principle aligned mitigation opportunities for companies to consider when designing their BVCM portfolios. The principle of scale, on the left-hand side is focused on maximizing climate mitigation um, and companies are recommended to consider funding mitigation that uh, firstly has lower abatement costs. So things like reduced conservation of natural ecosystems and energy efficiency, um, things that prevent ecological and climate tipping points. So things like prote protecting the climate sink function of natural ecosystems and phase out of fossil fuels, things that avoid high carbon technology or infrastructure lock-in, so renewable energy generation and distribution, green hydrogen, phase out of fossil fuels, things that have the potential to generate cascading positive impacts, so energy storage, green hydrogen, and demand side interventions such as dietary shift, and things that have uh, that finance uh, provide finance at the jurisdictional or landscape level. So we have jurisdictional red plus, which we'll hear more about later from Erin, um, and the jurisdictional fossil fuel phase out, um, and also things like uh, progressive climate ad uh, policy advocacy. The second principle of financing need is focused on funding under finance mitigation. For example, mitigation activities that need private sector finance to support countries delivery and potentially enhancement of naturally, na nationally determined contributions, NDCs to the Paris Agreement or activities that are underfinanced and in need of concessional or debt-free finance due to limited return on investment, longer payback periods, or higher investment risk. So things like phase out of coal, forest restoration, and conservation of natural ecosystems. The third principle of co-benefits encourages companies to consider how they can support the delivery of the wider sustainable development goals. This principle highlights opportunities that deliver co-benefits such as adaptation, resilience, livelihoods, water security, biodiversity, et cetera. Um, so this is things like the protection and restoration of coastal ecosystems and urban nature-based solutions. The fourth and final principle of climate justice is focused on addressing inequality. 
Companies are encouraged to consider activities um, which deliver mitigation in lower income countries that are more vulnerable to, uh, to climate change, to support disadvantaged and marginalized groups most impacted by climate change, to support and ensure that leadership and ownership efforts of indigenous peoples and local communities to deliver climate mitigation and adaptation through the protection and restoration of their traditional and customary lands. And finally, to support the just transition, for example, by facilitating the training of workers across sectors affected by the net zero transition. The report sets out a four step process for the design and implementation of high impact and high integrity BBCM strategies. The first step is to set and work to deliver a net zero target. The second step is to establish a BBCM pledge. The third step is to take action to deliver BBCM. And the fourth and final step is to report BBCM activities and outcomes. In the following slides, we have a set, um, uh, we have information with the recommendations within each of the sub steps that you can see on the slide here. We're gonna show some examples of relevant resources that are also included in the above and beyond report. So I realize there's a lot of information here and I'm just gonna focus on the key takeaways rather than reading out the information on the slide, but we will be making the slide deck available afterwards. Um, so you can have a look through this uh, separately. So the first step, step 1.1, is to develop and disclose a full greenhouse gas em emissions inventory. And we point to a number of greenhouse gas protocol resources that you can see on the slide. Step 1.2 is to set, submit, validate, and disclose the science-based net zero target. Again, we point to a number of SBTI resources, including the corporate net zero standard. Step 1.3 is to develop, disclose, and work towards a net zero aligned climate transition plan. We point to resources from CDP and the Transition Plan Task Force. Step two is a, to establish a BBCM pledge. And the first sub-step, 2.1, is to determine the business case and strategic objectives for BBCM. We highlight that the strategic objectives for BBCM should be integrated into the company's climate transition plan and associated disclosures to facilitate a holistic and strategic approach to climate action, both within and beyond the company's value chain. We point to resources from the World uh, Business Council for Sustainable Development, WBCSD, and the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, um, which provide information on climate risks and opportunities. Step 2.2 is to define the time period of the BBCM pledge. We recommend that companies make a forward-looking public pledge over a period of five years or greater. Step 2.3 is uh, to define the scale of the pledge. Um, and it's really important to acknowledge here that the SBTI recognizes that there is a varying ability to pay for BBCM across sectors, for example, based on differing profit profitability margins or things like different uh, costs for uh, uh, transitioning to net zero within their value chains. So the SBTI welcomes efforts, uh, all efforts by companies to go above and beyond their value chain emissions reductions through BBCM based on their business case and the ability to secure in internal buy-in and financial resources. Moreover, if a company's objective for implementing BBCM is to make a claim, which we will hear more about later from Mark, uh, the SBTI also recognizes that the size of the pledge would likely be determined by the specific requirements of that BBCM certification standard or claims code that they decide to follow. However, the SBTI does describe three different methods that companies can use to determine the scale of their BBCM pledge. The ton for ton method on the left is where a company delivers BBCM proportional to a defined percentage of its unabated value chain emissions. For example, a company might deliver one ton of BBCM for every ton of unabated value chain emissions. The money for ton uh, method in the middle is where a company channels finance towards BBCM by applying a carbon price to its unabated emissions. So for example, a, might, a company might fund 100 US dollars of BBCM for every one ton of unabated value chain emissions. Finally, the money for money method is where a company channels finance towards BBCM based on a defined percentage of profit or revenue. The pros and cons and best practice application of each of these methods are discussed within the above and beyond report. However, the SPTI does provide a best practice recommendation whereby a company would apply a science-based carbon price to its unabated scope one, two, and three emissions to determine a financial budget. 
This is essentially aligned with the money for ton method that I described on the previous slide, the middle uh, diagram. The SBTI considers a science-based carbon price to represent the economic value of greenhouse gas emissions based on A, the robust scientific assessment of the external cost of greenhouse gas emissions, i.e. the cost of emissions that the public pays for, the robust scientific assessment of the expected costs associated with achieving um, a 1.5 degree pathway, and or the true and complete cost to fully and permanently abate a given greenhouse gas emission. The financial budget that is determined can then be used to fund a combination of activities that align with the BBCM goals and principles described earlier. Given the importance of near-term mitigation, the SBTI proposes that a portion of the budget is used to deliver ex post BBCM outcomes equivalent to 50% of the company's scope 1, 2, and 3 emissions. So this is essentially a 50% ton-for-ton recommendation, and it really places emphasis on BBCM goal 1. With the remaining budget, it is recommended that a company would then fund a combination of additional ex post BBCM outcomes, again, aligned with goal one, the scale up of nascent climate solution uh, solutions and enabling activities in, in alignment with BBCM goal two, and adaptation and loss and damage. There is an increasing recognition of the importance of stimulating private sector funding for adaptation and loss and damage to supplement constrained public sector funding. Where companies use the social cost of carbon to determine their financial budget, it is consistent that a portion of funds should be deployed to support adaptation and loss and damage, since the social cost of carbon represents the marginal global damage cost of emissions. It is important to note that the SPTI acknowledges that this vision of best practice would involve significant costs for some companies, and therefore it is unlikely to be widely adopted at this point in time. Step 3.1 is to define quality standards and guardrails for BBCM activities and investments. Min minimum quality standards should ensure additionality, permanence, avoidance of leakage, avoidance of double counting where relevant. Companies should also commit uh, to and disclose safeguarding principles to ensure that their BBCM activities do not have an adverse impact on things such as human rights, gender equality and biodiversity. We highlight certain standards and guidelines such as the carbon credit Credit Quality Initiative, the Tropical Forest Credit Integrity Guide, and the Integrity Council for the Voluntary Carbon Market, ICVCM. Step 3.2 is to deploy resources and finance towards a portfolio of BVCM activities. It is recommended that companies direct finance and resources where they are most needed in line with the BVCM goals and principles described earlier. There is a detailed annex in the report which describes principle aligned mitigation opportunities, which I highlighted earlier. And this draws from reports, including the IPCC uh, uh, AR6, the report of the independent high level expert group on climate finance and the 2023 climate inequalities report. Step 4.1 uh, is to establish BBCM monitoring, reporting, and verification. We point to a number of key resources, including the Architecture for Red Plus Transactions Trees Standard and the Voluntary Carbon Market Integrity Initiative, um, which has published a monitoring, reporting, and insurance framework. Step 4.2 uh, is to report annually on BBCM activities and investments. Companies should report transparently on the finance deployed towards BBCM, as well as the mitigation interventions and outcomes and co-benefits delivered on an annual basis in line with the company's greenhouse gas inventory reporting period. Emissions reductions and removal should be reported separately. Useful resources include the CDP Climate Questionnaire, the, tri the, the Transition Plan uh, Task Force Disclosure Framework, and Carbon Market Watch's BBCM Disclosure Template, which you can see on this slide. Step 4.3, um, which is the final step, I'm sure you'll be pleased to hear, uh, is to make transparent and accurate BBCM claims. The Voluntary Carbon Markets Integrity Initiative, Gold Standard, and the International Social and Environmental Accrediting Labeling Alliance, ICEAL, have all provided useful guidance on this topic. It is worth highlighting that this, this report distinguishes between compensatory and co contribution claims. Climate compensation claims are those which convey to audiences that avoiding, reducing, or removing greenhouse gas emissions beyond the value chain of a company counterbalances or nets out emissions released within the operations or value chain of a company. 
An example of a compensation claim is carbon neutrality. Compensation claims are increasingly the subject of public scrutiny and regulation in different jurisdictions, including the European Union. On the other hand, climate contribution claims are those which convey to organizations that the, that the that, sorry, those that convey to audiences that the organization has provided support or finance to actions beyond the company's value chain with an expected climate mitigation outcome. Unlike compensation claims, uh, contribution claims do not imply that the BVCM outcomes are netting out or counterbalancing the claimant's remaining value chain emissions. Instead, they are communicated as a contribution to global mitigation efforts or even the efforts of the country. Finally, very importantly to underscore that the SPTI does not have plans at this time to validate BVCM claims. So uh, moving on to the second report, uh, Raising the Bar, um, we, we published this report really as a complement to the above and uh, beyond report, and it's focused on accelerating corporate adoption of BBCM. It draws upon SPTI's research to, dis to consider both the barriers that limit private sector adoption of BBCM, as well as the positive incentives that have the potential to accelerate adoption. Based on the research findings, this report provides recommendations for different actors, offering a shared vision and theory of change for scaling corporate climate finance in B into BBCM over the coming decades. The report poses a problem statement and a vision upon which the recommendations of this report have been formulated. The problem statement is that there are, there are an insufficient number of companies funding and delivering BBCM consistently and at a scale commensurate with the magnitude of the climate crisis. The vision is that a critical mass of companies are going beyond science-based targets to also fund and deliver BBCM, collectively contributing a significant volume of finance and mitigation to address the climate crisis. The report includes the results of our research on barriers to and incentives for corporate adoption of BVCM. The graphs here are excerpts from the BVCM public consultation, which was held in June and July last year, 2023. It shows that companies, financial institutions, and small and medium-sized enterprise identified the fear of greenwash accusation as the greatest barrier preventing BVCM adoption, and tax, tax incentives were identified as the most impactful incentive mechanism. Based on this research, we propose a toolbox for addressing barriers and incentivizing adoption of BBCM. We provide recommendations for a range of actors across these five pillars that you can see on the slide. Engage, build buy-in and educate a range of stakeholders on why corporate investment into BBCM is needed, how it benefits them and provide guidance on best practice. Enable, to enable companies to fund and deliver BBCM through tools and mechanisms for deployment. Incentivize, send market signals to incentivize companies to fund and deliver BVCM. Mandate, so mandate companies to fund and deliver BVCM or to report on BVCM activities and investments. And finally, mobilize, build momentum to mobilize and accelerate adoption and implementation of BVCM. So for example, the report highlights that policymakers have the ability to accelerate corporate adoption of BVCM through the development of governance mechanisms, standards, and claims regulation to ensure integrity and to level the playing field to reduce the risk of greenwashing associated with BVCM. Researchers and academics uh, can develop monitoring and mapping tools to identify areas of high investment and impact potential. Advocacy NGOs can run mobilization campaigns to encourage businesses to take action on BVCM. In this report, we conclude that no one actor nor any one action will be sufficient to create a norm around BVCM. Every actor has a role in building a network of influence over time that encourages greater climate action by the corporate sector. For this reason, we are delighted to be joined uh, by other actors working to accelerate corporate adoption of BVCM. I'm gonna hand back to Alice, uh, who will reintroduce our guest speakers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Scarlett. Um, as we've already mentioned, we're really pleased to welcome three guest speakers today who will each present for five minutes. If you do have any questions for the speakers, please use the JOT form link that we have shared in the chat. So first of all, I'm pleased to introduce Owen Hewlett, Chief Technical Officer of Gold Standard. So over to you, Owen. 
Thanks, Alice. And hi, everyone. Good morning. If we can um, bring my first slide up. Um, so we, we look back actually this week because I think, um, well, I know we've released uh, a BBCM how-to guidance that reflects some of the ideas in SBTI's papers and builds upon, from a few years ago, WWF's corporate blueprint for climate and nature, which is something I recommend reading. And it's interesting because we'd actually started um, talking about this, writing our first articles about shifting on from um, the idea of offsetting to the idea of BBCM way back in 2016. So it's really exciting to see how different actors have come together to move this idea forward. And one thing you, you get in this space a lot is, is interest and opinion as opposed to logic and fact. And one thing you, you may have noticed in the discourse is you get ideas like it must be carbon removals and not reductions, or it must be carbon markets and nothing else, or it mustn't be carbon markets, they're evil. All, all of those things are unhelpful, I think. There's a logical way of progressing through. And I, I want to kind of share a little bit about how we're thinking about the qualities and mechanisms needed to enact BBCM. And we do that in a simple logical framework at GS. Um, we assess a credible scope of responsibility, i.e. a company's um, value chain emissions. And then you move into the act of responsibility. In this case, it's twin. It's to abate those emissions as Scarlett um, shared, um, and then to act on those unabated emissions. And one way to read BVCM is that the act of offsetting um, is evolved into a more appropriate act that represents an essential need to act on unabated ongoing emissions that are obviously harmful. And then you get into the mechanisms, the qualities and the mechanisms needed to deliver that act. And that's really important because rather than saying it must or it mustn't be carbon markets, it must or it mustn't be removals, um, really it's a question of does that mechanism deliver the qualities needed to make the act true? So if we go on a slide there, please. Um, last year in May, we released uh, a, what, a document called Fairly Contributing to Global Net Zero, which set out a framework for the five things that a company should have in its um, climate strategy. And we're really speaking about responsibility for unabated emissions there. The pedant in me wants to say BBCM is the act act rather than the responsibility. The responsibility is to, is to the unabated emissions. Um, and if we go on a slide, the way we framed it is actually similar four steps to those that Scarlett laid out. So it's to account and report those unabated emissions using things like the greenhouse gas protocol. Um, and then we favor strongly the setting and maintaining of an internal carbon fee, as opposed to a ton for ton approach that we saw in, in offsetting. And the reason for that is, um, is primarily about how you value the importance of this responsibility um, and how it affects business decisions and um, how it uh, doesn't rate limit the amount of mitigation that you can target. And with that internal fee, it's to fund high quality climate action and make credible claims. And just briefly to fund high quality action, if we go on a slide, what we mean by that is does the action and the mechanism have the quality attributes to, de to deliver that? And working in threes again, uh, we break down quality attributes into three buckets. So relationship attributes speak to the relationship of the action with the company value chain. In this case, BBCM, as it implies, needs to be outside the organization's value chain. And we recommend they're targeting things that are actually outside everyone's value chain, at least for a, a proportion of um, BBCM. So things like restoration of nature and supporting impoverished communities. Uh, then you have accounting and reporting attributes. So, you know, which methodologies, what's the acceptable level of data quality? Are we using, you know, which forms of accounting and how do we address double counting? And there we recommend using um, many of the, the accounting norms of the carbon markets. I think those are the most appropriate for this purpose. And then lastly, we talk about action attributes. So what, what activities to support? Should they be additional? Yes. Should they be permanent? Actually, that's interesting. Um, offsetting requires uh, a construct for permanence, but we speak about durability in BBCM um, so that we don't have this kind of false accounting construct. Um, and then lastly, just from me, if we go on to my last but one slide, is just to say, if you know the quality attributes that a mechanism can deliver, then you can start to map which parts of the system that mechanism can serve. And so I won't go through all of this other than to say, um, clearly carbon credits for example, can deliver a lot of those quality attributes and are fit for different parts of this system. So rather than saying it must be or it must not be carbon markets, uh, we've rather said it can be carbon markets, a very useful contribution to specific parts of the ecosystem. And then just quickly onto my last slide, just to say, 
Um, the guidance is published this week. Do reach out to myself or my colleague, Dan McGraw. You can see our email addresses there uh, and you can find me on LinkedIn if you want to read more. We've got a webinar coming up on the 27th. Thanks very much. Great, thank you so much, Joan. Perfectly to time and really interesting talk. So I'm now pleased to introduce Mark Kenber, Executive Director at the Voluntary Carbon Markets Integrity Initiative. Over to you, Mark. Thank you very much, Alice. And also thanks to SBTI and Scarlett in particular for that very comprehensive view of uh, beyond value chain mitigation options. And I, I, mean, I think it just, it's worth emphasising at this point, as both Scarlett and Owen have said, that in 2024, we're not in a position to choose between one thing or other that we do. We need companies to decarbonize as quickly and deeply as possible. And we also need huge investments in uh, what we're calling here beyond value chain mitigation. That's to say actions to reduce and remove emissions all around the world. VCMI um, is, is particularly focused on the, the carbon market aspect of this. And we look to answer the question, how can companies credibly engage with voluntary or generally with carbon markets and what can they credibly say about that engagement? And so we've published uh, last year a claims code of practice that specifically looks to provide steps that companies should, can and should follow when they're investing in voluntary carbon markets in a way that satisfies that sort of initial question. How can they make those investments scale up the level of climate finance that is needed uh, while at the same time decarbonizing their economies? And it's, uh, as you'll see in a moment, our guidance very closely follows what Scarlett has just laid out for everybody. Uh, so if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, so we publish, as I mentioned, uh, this claims code of practice, which establishes uh, carbon integrity claims. And Scarlett mentioned in her presentation that uh, SBTI doesn't seek to certify or validate these claims, but provides the guidance. And we're providing a certification process for one part of that. And I should emphasize it's not all the BVCM that Scarlett uh, and even Owen have referred to, but just use of carbon credits as part of a broader uh, corporate climate strategy. And we uh, established four steps that companies should follow to be able to make a carbon integrity claim. And it will, it's pretty, will be pretty obvious that these are very similar to the steps that both uh, SBTI and Gold Standard are recommending. So step one, before a company even engages with voluntary carbon markets, they should meet a set of foundational criteria. And these foundational criteria are designed to represent good or best corporate practice on climate change. And they include things such as uh, having an independently verified and publicly disclosed inventory, having a net zero target no later than 2050, having a set of a set, set of science aligned near term targets. And we very clearly signpost in our claims code of practice that the SBTI approach is the one that companies should follow. Uh, companies should also demonstrate uh, how they are going to meet these targets. And one way of doing that is by demonstrating uh, that they have good corporate governance, for example, that exec senior executive pay uh, is linked to uh, carbon targets um, and uh, re uh, report on their capex and opex related to carbon emission reductions. And as others have mentioned, if they have one, publish a transition plan. We also recognize that it's important that companies uh, not only walk the talk, but talk the walk and therefore expect companies to uh, have an assured statement that says that their lobbying or public advocacy activities are aligned with the Paris Agreement and their own net zero commitments. And those are all prerequisites that companies should meet before thinking about uh, how they should, they should engage with voluntary carbon markets and make an associated claim. The second then step then is to decide what claim to make, and I'll describe the claims in a moment. But what underpins all of these claims and hence the use or engagement with voluntary carbon markets is that companies should be have either met their next near term science aligned target or be demonstrably on track to do so. Now, if the company is making a claim in their target year, let's say it's 2025 or 2030, then given that most companies targets have a numerical emissions figure, it's relatively not totally, but relatively straightforward to uh, verify that they have met their target. But given that many companies don't have targets till 2030, well, we want companies to, we want to encourage companies to start making beyond value chain investments now, because we can't wait till 2030 for making those investments. 
we've developed some tools which will need we will improve over time to come to assess whether a company is on track or not to meet its targets and those again going back to some of the metrics i mentioned before they include emissions reductions emissions intensity reductions but also financial and other metrics associated with the investments they're making in their own internal decarbonization. So once they have either met their target or demonstrated that the company is on track to meet its target, it then can invest in uh, high quality carbon credits. And BCMI defines high quality carbon credits as those that meet the core carbon principles established by the Integrity Council by the Voluntary Carbon Market, which Scarlett referred to earlier. And the ICBCM uh, is has a, a two-part assessment framework, one looking at the quality of the carbon crediting program standards like gold standard, which Owen is representing here today, um, and at the second level, different project categories that meet uh, the, the standard requirements of a high quality carbon credit. For example, and these have been mentioned already, the additional, additionality uh, baselines, uh, not over crediting, not double counting, permanence, and so on and so forth. Uh, so we require companies to follow the core carbon principles established by the ICBCM. And then, as, is, as others have also mentioned, uh, have most of that information uh, assured? Certainly, all of the information, including each of in relation, information related to each one of the steps I've outlined, disclosed in public. And I think one of the, given the concerns that, that the public has had quite rightly about uh, the use of carbon markets and the quality of carbon credits. We below believe that this radical transparency is essential to build trust, not only in uh, carbon markets, but in beyond value chain mitigation altogether. So those four steps, foundational criteria, corporate best practice on climate change, demonstrating progress to meeting your targets, uh, buying and retiring carbon credits to cover the remaining emissions, and then full validation and disclosure. Next step, next slide, please. So, as I mentioned, there are three uh, carbon integrity claims, silver, gold, and platinum. And what distinguishes these from each other is the uh, percentage or proportion of a company's emissions using the ton per ton approach that Scarlett outlined that a company covers uh, using uh, carbon credits. And so for to make a silver claim, a company would have to cover between 10 and 50% of its emissions uh, with carbon credits that they've retired, gold between 50 and 100%, and platinum 100% plus. And so we saw uh, just two weeks ago, Bain and Company become the first company to make a carbon integrity platinum claim, which means that it has demonstrated and had independently verified that it is on track to meet its science aligned, in its case, the science-based target, and is covering all its remaining emissions with high integrity carbon credits. Uh, just a, a final point, and this goes to uh, something that uh, Scarlett mentioned about compensation versus contribution. In the, we, as, alongside the claims code itself, you've already seen the monitoring, reporting and assurance framework that Scarlett highlighted in her presentation. We also have a number of other uh, accompanying documents, one of which explains how companies uh, should refer and describe their claims. And the way we frame it, is that a company should say that it's uh, investing and retiring carbon credits in a volume equivalent to its emissions, such that they are contributing both to the host country's achievement of its uh, climate objectives and to overall global mitigation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark, for that interesting talk. I'm now Pleased to introduce our final speaker, Erin Bloom Garden, CEO of Emergent, which convenes the Leaf Coalition. Over to you. Thank you, Alice. Um, and thank you, uh, um, Scarlett, for the comprehensive overview of, of the of the reports. And, and also kudos to SBTI for, <clears throat> for these reports, um, a powerful and, and comprehensive guidance on, on uh BBCM. Uh, I, in a moment, I, I, I'd like to tell you a bit more about the LEAF Coalition, which provides a pathway for companies uh, that are interested in accessing high integrity BBCM. But let me first say uh, that uh, this is, to be clear, the strongest statement yet from SBTI 
uh, that it believes that you know, corporate investment in uh, beyond value chain mitigation is necessary uh, and urgent. Uh, it leaves really no doubt uh, that companies must be looking to invest in mitigation outside their value chains uh, alongside the deep value chain reductions that are required to meet uh, the science-based uh, targets. Uh, because even with a science-based targets, uh, we'll have gigatons of carbon will still be released freely into the atmosphere uh, on that pathway to net zero. So we really need to, uh, we really need BVCM uh, to drive action at scale uh, to, to give us the best chance of, of reaching um, our, our net zero targets. Um, and so uh, BVCM, really a critical strategy in corporate net zero uh, pathways. Uh, and this uh, is really very uh, clear guidance. So um, the report highlights uh, jurisdictional red plus as one of the key uh, tools, uh, BVCM tools uh, for near-term mitigation that uh, companies can use. So what is jurisdictional red plus? So red plus uh, has been around for about 15 years. It stands for reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, uh, essentially uh, reversing deforestation and, uh, and protecting forests. Uh, deforestation uh, is a not, uh, forests are not only a sink, but a, the act of deforestation is also a source of emissions between 10 and 20 percent of emissions themselves. And so any global climate strategy must take into account uh, reversing defor uh, deforestation. Uh, jurisdictional, uh, the, the jurisdictional piece means that uh, this is focused on states or nations. Um, for those of you familiar with projects, it's uh, uh, it's zooming out the aperture to uh, to the entire uh, country or the entire state. What that does is it, it solves some of the technical issues that have been uh, uh, around things like leakage and permanence that have uh, or addresses those that have been uh, problematic on on some projects. It also unlocks a, a, a toolbox um, uh, of beyond finance. Uh, but the, the, the tools that uh, government can, can uh, also bring to bear, uh, uh, regu uh, regulation, enforcement, policy, et cetera. Uh, so, so that's jurisdictional red. It also provides a, an effective way to scale these schemes, uh, uh, scale, you know, scale action. Um, and so it, it provides an opportunity to tackle deforestation at scale uh, which is, 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 of course, needed. Uh, it mobilizes direct government action uh, to address the underlying causes of, of, uh, of deforestation. And so jurisdictional RED+, plus, sometimes referred to as JRED, really delivers on all four principles of uh, BBCM guidance outlined by Scarlet and by SBTI. And those are, uh, just to refresh, scale, finance, finance need, co-benefits, uh, and climate uh, and climate justice, um, and further, the role of jurisdictional red is highlighted prominently in the indicative case studies uh, in the reports. So, uh, our view is that uh, one of the highest and best uses of BVCM or is is uh, jurisdictional uh, jurisdictional red. Uh, now, let me just mention uh, briefly uh, what the Leaf Coalition is. Uh, Leaf Coalition provides uh, companies and corporations with a platform. Uh, to demonstrate climate le leadership by coming together to tackle deforestation. Uh, LEAF provides access to high integrity carbon credits to companies. It's a unique public-private partnership model uh, that provides companies with access to credits, but also mobilizes finance at scale uh, to uh, provide uh, that much needed finance uh, to countries and states to tackle deforestation. LEAF is backed by four donor governments, US, Norway, UK, and South Korea. And we currently have about 25 corporate climate leaders who have signed up so far, far as high integrity, high integrity, both on the supply and the demand side. Uh, on the supply side, we use the Art Tree standard uh, and we have buyers, really one of the first initiatives to create uh, buyers and uh, 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 criteria on the, on the demand side. Uh, at COP28 we, uh, in Dubai, we announced the first supply transaction, the first deals with Ghana and Costa Rica to supply credits to leaf buyers. Uh, and we are moving now to, our, we expect this year to have about between five and 10 uh, transactions with, uh, with a real focus on, on the Amazon uh, and Brazil, uh, and then uh, the other tropical forest basins in Africa uh, and, and, and Asia.
so um, as I say, that uh, JRED ticks all of the boxes for BBCM of SBTI. Uh, we are looking uh, now at really scaling our initiative, uh, right? The, the scaling the finance, scaling to the, uh, other uh, geographies and jurisdictions, and so we're looking for other companies uh, to join us to uh, to, real, to to reverse deforestation. Our goal is to is to halt and reverse reverse deforestation by uh, by 2030. So uh, thank you very much uh, to SBTI for including us in this, and we welcome uh, you know, welcome uh, uh, partnerships from uh, from those on the call, and and especially corporates uh, looking to uh, implement BBCM. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, Owen, Mark, and Aaron, for those comprehensive presentations. We're now going to open for questions and answers before closing today's webinar. Great, so Alberto and Scarlett, if you're there, we've had lots of questions come in. Um, I'll start with the first one. This has been a common theme, I think, one for you, Alberto. Um, what's next for the SBTI on BVCM? Thanks, Alice. Um, well, we're not planning for the work at this point on, on BVCM. Um, we will start the review of the Copenhagen standard this year, and we're going to be sharing on our website more details about this plan revision. Um, so please yeah, keep an eye on, on our channels. Right, thank you, Alberto. Um, another interesting one that we've had in for you, Scarlett. Um, can you explain the difference between BVCM and neutralization? Yeah, sure. So, um, in my presentation earlier, I highlighted that the net zero standard has four elements: so near-term targets, long-term targets, BVCM, and neutralization. And we see them as two kind of distinct things and we actually have an annex in the above and beyond report i think it's the first one annex a um which has a table that really like distinguishes very clearly between the two topics and concepts um and it it compares them in terms of you know their definition uh the eligible mitigation outcomes so whether they're removals or reductions or both um their status within the net zero standards, so whether they're required or um, or recommended, and their purpose, and also their timing. Um, so maybe just maybe I can kind of run through those as well quickly now. Um, so BVCM, as I mentioned, has two purposes. It's to do with um, taking responsibility for unabated emissions that continue to be released into the atmosphere. And it's also about accelerating the global net zero transition. Um, and we recommend that companies do it now. And consistently, whereas neutralization of residual emissions is what happens once a company's science-based target has actually been achieved. So once uh, we have a cross-sector pathway for, for net zero, which is a 90% reduction in emissions by 2050 at the latest. And so by that, by that, therefore, companies would have some emissions left over, those that we consider to be infeasible to abate. We call these residual emissions. Um, and so the purpose of neutralization is actually focused on that end state. So it's, you know, at 2050 or when, if, if your target is earlier, your net zero target, um, then that would be when neutralization happens. Um, and while BVCM is both emissions reductions and removals, and we really highlight that both are essential, um, we need to remove as many emissions from the atmosphere as, uh, sorry, we need to reduce and eliminate as many emissions um, as possible, uh, and we need to remove those that are left over. So we need to scale some of those technologies. So BVCM is both reductions and removals, whereas neutralization is is limited to removal of carbon from the atmosphere after the net zero target has been achieved. Very importantly, we say that those removals for neutralization have to be permanent. And we haven't defined exactly what will count as permanent removals at this point in time. We have, uh, we're in un undergoing research on this topic and there's you know, debate within the academic world um, as well as in policy spheres on, on permanence. So we will be providing further guidance on that in future iterations of the corporate net zero standard. But yeah, Annex A essentially covers this in quite a lot of detail. So I refer you to, to that. Thanks, Alice. Thanks, Scarlett, for that really clear answer. I think we've got time for one more quick question. Another one for you, Scarlett. Um, what's the difference between BVCM and insetting? 
Yes, sure. So um, insetting is a term which actually it hasn't been kind of consistently defined, um, but maybe I'll think about the greenhouse gas protocol. Um, so their definition in their draft land sector and removals guidance is essentially um, where you're and I refer you to the document because I'm not going to remember it off the top of my head, but it's essentially where reductions or enhanced removals um, occur within a company's value chain and they are funded through carbon credits. Um, and so, as I say, the greenhouse gas protocol says that these are where you're using carbon credits in your company's value chain, whereas BVCM is by definition beyond the value chain. So that is the very clear distinction. Inserting in value chain, beyond value chain, beyond value chain. I know it can get confusing because you can use carbon credits for both, um, but that is really the, the difference. And we're really uh, anticipating and excited about the finalization of the greenhouse gas land sector and removals guidance, which should provide more clarity on that for companies. So I think that's hopefully clear and I'll hand back to you, Alice. Thank you. Thank you, Scarlett and Alberto. Um, I think that's all the time we have for questions today. If we can have the slides back. Um, yeah, we received a huge number of questions. So thank you so much to everyone that submitted. Um, if we weren't able to answer your questions today, we will endeavor to do so in our future communication. So please do follow us on social media and sign up for our newsletter to keep informed. As we said, we'll be uploading the webinar recording onto the SBTI website soon, along with the slide deck that we presented today. And the link that you can see on the slide on your screen now shows where all of the SBTI's resources are housed. And we'll also post this in the chat. And you can see on the screen that we've translated the executive summary of the above and beyond report into Arabic, French, Japanese, Mandarin, Portuguese, and Spanish. And we'll also be uploading translations of this webinar deck. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you to all of our speakers and goodbye.